Welcome back. Welcome for the first time. Nice to see some familiar names and faces. Big thank you to Dr. Elizabeth Allison and Charlie Forbes for your coordination of this exciting summit in queer ecology. So for those who don't know, my name is Shmi Giratana. Um, I am really just overjoyed to be here today. I'm, I'm containing it for my Zoom posture, um, you know, trying to keep it in, in the box for now. Um, I, <laughs> I am a, a part of the CIIS community in my role in student affairs um, as a director of student success, um, which gives me a lot of room to play. So uh, for those students who are in this place, um, please come by and visit me sometimes in, a, in the third floor, room 302. Um, and for the whole community, um, thank you so much for your engagement with CIIS. Um, together, we really grow beyond the spaces that we cultivate in the classroom, um, both virtually and on campus. I also am a former member of the ESR community, Ecology, Spirituality, and Religion. So it's really such a joy uh, to be dropping back in uh, with these community spaces. So our panel today, our community space, um, is bringing together two organizations, Weaving Earth and Queer Nature. And we're going to center the conversation around a recent collaboration um, called Attune, uh, where they all share space as collaborators through facilitation, education, mentorship, um, and guidance in various ways of relating to individual and collective attention with, in, and for the more than human ecologies. Uh, so there's so many doorways to like step into this space together. Um, but before we do any of that, I'd like to invite you to join me for a moment of grounding. Um, I uh, personally always have to check myself when I'm coming into these buzzing online spaces um, and like to offer a reminder to anyone who's open to it, to just keep your senses alive to the physical space that you're in. Um, while these online environments can sometimes feel limiting or extracting of energy, I find that um, to connect with where I am physically embodied and also let that be a point of connection to other folks who are sharing attention um, into the Zoom space. Um, so a way I do that is through awareness of my physicality, and an empathy for the physicality of all those who are connecting in here. And with that, you know, there are countless people, countless energies, forces of life, more than human folks who labor and effort and give so that we might gather here today. Those who are rarely acknowledged, but really make this all possible. Uh, so I invite you to join me in offering some gratitude and care into this space, into our spaces, for each of our interconnections. And that gratitude and care can be channeled through breath if you're looking for a way to focus your attention in these invitations. I'd also like to acknowledge all those who've come before us, those that we know, those that we do not know, the named and unnamed, and with that, holding the complexities of each of our histories, acknowledging how all of it is carried forward into today, into this very moment. And as a hosting member of the CIIS community, I want to acknowledge that at CIIS on campus, we operate, gather, and benefit each and every day on the land of the Ramatush Ohlone people. These are the enduring caregivers of the city we call San Francisco. And we seek to stand in solidarity with the indigenous people of this land by doing our parts to honor our shared histories and take steps towards righting the wrongs of the past. And I invite you again to take a moment to acknowledge the spirits and people indigenous to the land that you occupy, the lands that raise you, 
the lands that you tend in caring stewardship of community. And for any of you who are interested in learning more and supporting native lands, languages, and territories, I've shared a list of resources in the chat. Uh, these websites are helpful for you to learn about and acknowledge the indigenous lands where you reside, as well as ways to act in solidarity. So thank you so much for uh, for our shared attention to that. I feel like attention is gonna be my hot word right now um, for this whole conversation. Um, so let's continue to lift up um, some, some buzzing vocabulary into the space um, so we can grow from this uh, initial call to, uh, to focus on a tune. And uh, with that, I'm happy to introduce uh, our guests today. Um, first, we have Taylor Shanae. Taylor is a woman of color a mother, a healer, a researcher, and a living body, a living body that just waved at all of us. So um, of course, please wave back. We've got reactions if you're off screen. Um, you know, smile can sometimes do so much, but remember we're all we're all alive and engaging here. Um, Taylor is a member of the CIS alum community um, with a master's in psychological studies and a concentration in somatic psychology. Um, she's also currently pursuing her PhD in women's spirituality here at CIIS, and her current research focuses on the liberating childbirth process from hypermechanization in order to return the human race to earth. Empowering mothers and birth givers is one way her activism shows up on behalf of the living earth. So thank you so much, Taylor, uh, for all your contributions and all the ways you open us into new ways of being or in new ways of remembering. Also like to welcome Bronte Velez, whose work, hi Bronte, <laughs> whose work and rest, I emphasize, and rest is guided by the cosmology and promise of Sabbath for black people and the land. As a black Latina transdisciplinary artist, trickster, educator, hibare and wake worker, their eco-social art praxis lives at the intersections of Black feminist placemaking, abolitionist theologies, environmental regeneration, and death doulaship, and the levity of the absurd. Their prayer for life is to support safe and hilarious passage through climate collapse. They care for the crossroads of attending to Black health and imagination, commemorative justice, and hospicing the shit that hurts black folks and the earth through servicing as a creative director for Led to Life Ritual Arts Collective and Adults Program Director and Educator for Ancestral Art Skills and Nature Connection School Weaving Earth. They are currently co-conjuring a film with Esperanza Spaulding in collaboration with the San Francisco Symphony and also practicing pastoral care in an ecological and ministral sense, as a co-steward of a land refuge in Kashaya Pomo territory in Northern California. Mostly Bronte is up to the sweet tender rhythm of quotidian black queer life making, ever committed to humor and liberation, ever marked by grief at the distance made between us and all of life. Thank you Bronte and also for uh, the poetry that, <laughs> that rolls through these words. As we continue to open and ground with this space, I am happy to introduce So Sinopoulos Lloyd, a white queer Greek American, I so, who grew up in the Northern hardwood forests of Alnobach territory, um, also known as central Vermont. So works variously as an outdoor educator, wilderness EMT and writer. So worked as a seasonal shepherd throughout college and considers their life path to be deeply inspired by the combined resilience and tenderness of the cloven hoof. They founded Queer Nature with their spouse, Pinar, in 2015, where the two developed nature-based programming for LGBTQ, LGBTQ2+. Plus. Hmm. Always a reminder to slow down when you connect into community, you know what I mean? <clears throat> where the two develop nature-based programming for LGBTQ2+, plus people 
with a focus on nature connection, survival skills, and transformative experience through the lens of decolonization and social and environmental justice. The soul of So's work in and around nature is animated by studies of identity, place, notions of the sacred, and interspecies relationship within the context of colonization, globalization, migration, and climate change. So holds a master's in religious studies from Claremont Graduate University and has studied place-based skills at Roots School and Wilderness Awareness School. Some of their favorite nature connection practices are wildlife tracking and stealth craft. And closing out our introductions, I'd like to welcome Pinar Sinopoulos Lloyd. Hi, Pinar. Thank you for being here. Uh, Pinar is an indigenous futurist, mentor, consultant, and eco-philosopher. They're a co-founder of Queer Nature. They're an organism of stewarding earth-based queer community through ancestral skills, interspecies solidarity, and rites of passage. Enchanted by the liminal, Pinar is a neurodivergent NB with, with Huanca, Turkish, and Chinese lineages. As a QTIBIPOC outdoor catalyst, their inspiration is envisioning decolonially informed queer ancestral futurism through interspecies accountability and the remediation of human exceptionalism in the, and you will please redirect my pronunciation, the tool, Tulkistin, their relationship with queerness, hybridity, neurodivergence, indigeneity and belonging guided their work in developing queer eco-psychology with a thematic and depth approach through a decolonial lens. As a survival skills mentor, one of their core missions is to uplift and amplify the brilliant survival skills that BIPOC, LGBTQ2, SIA+, and other intersectional systematically targeted populations already have in their resilient bodies and stories of survivance. They're a member of Diversify Outdoors Coalition. And you can follow Pinar and our other guests work online um, where they're plugged in on websites and Instagram um, and other social media outlets. Um, so thank you all for your graciousness with my human tongue um, and reading skills. Uh, again, please uh, introduce any repronunciations, um, corrections or otherwise. Um, but without any further ado, I'm so excited to open up the conversation into a focus on a tune. Um, and does anyone feel called to uh, jump into that conversation and share about a tune and this project as a collaboration between Weaving Earth and Queer Nature? I'm happy to begin. Um, thank you so much, me, for introducing us and I'm just so grateful to this gathering and all who are present and to hear those bios. I just getting to be in this um, session with Pinar and So and Kayla and our other colleagues in Quell Springs and Chumash territory just a couple of weeks ago to hear to see their work. Um, and to experience their work and be transformed by their work and scholarship and practices there. Um, and then to hear those bios and the, just the confirmation of, you know, people's bios don't be, uh, they be exaggerated. <laughs> so just <laughs> to hear those bios and to really have seen you all's living practices is just so nourishing. Um, so I'm just with, I'm just with that poetry and we just got back from a session two of three offerings in a nine month arc where adult participants are gathering to divest their attention from capitalist temporalities and temporalities that have been haunted by uh, white supremacists and colonial timescapes and ways that our attention attention has been misused and abused and extracted from being able to be present and witness uh, the earth and one another and ourselves and our bodies and our ancestors and to 
attuned to these sweet and precious um, liberatory temporalities. So that's kind of been the orientation and we've been doing that through various studies in bird language and in somatics and in tracking and in scholarship and prophetic attention and am I missing I mean there's some there's a lot of different kind of explorations we've been in um, prescribed fire and attending to the land and wild tending um, and craft and ritual craft so and play kind of, and play <laughs> And play. so much play <laughs> um so many games and singing so it's just been a weird a weird group of mystics coming together to experiment with other forms of attention and practices that um redirect our attention towards the earth And I'm hearing them that also the quality of attention, where the attention is directed and the quality of presence that is invited in through these practices of somatic awareness and play and, and listening. Yeah, it's been, um, it's been a process it feels like in which we've been inviting folks that have come, that been have been called to this program to come together and, and risk being in the present moment together and um, see what is possible when we, when we really allow ourselves to be in the now moment um, and whatever surfaces, both across a landscape in substrate across the sky within our own cells inside of relationship um, and coming out of this time together, kind of being in the desert um, right before the spring equinox and the textures of chill and the textures of sand and, and the quality of time and being able to actually let ourselves move out of kind of Kronos time into Kairos time into a way where we were we were allowing our kind of grip on what we've been taught is reality inside of this kind of mechanistic way of relating and doing and tracking and making sure we're on top of the thing. And did I do the thing and where and who am I supposed to all of those checklists, um, letting all of that, letting that quality of attention of what's a, what is here for us today and what can I be here for today? Um, be really altered by landscape and by qualities of attention that um, increased our actual stamina for relationship um, across the board, relationship to self, relationship to one another, as well as relationship to weather, relationship to element, relationship to more than human kin, um, relationship to time in a, in, a, in a large and small kind of way. Um, and that's really what it's felt like this this pro this process of a tune has really felt like it's how do we actually re-embed ourselves um, in ecological time scales and in ecological relationships that allows us to not know and be found out um, as we as we um, kind of un unpack and shed the layers of our of our kind of habituated patterns of relating. Yeah, and one thing I'll add to that too, just as um, I sort of felt feel like I came into this program with a bit of a niche offering, which is bringing wildlife tracking to to that offering with along with Pinar and you know like all of the teaching team. And I think what what's really compelling for me about weaving Earth and one way that I and queer nature kind of relates to them so much as an organization is there's this it feels like there's this um really like nuanced and beautiful blending of of and bringing in of of naturalist quote unquote naturalist observation and tracking as a mystical practice and bird language and animal observing animal behavior um and i think that's held really well i um i've noticed that um approaches to wildlife tracking or i guess what you could call like 
the meaning that we map onto animals. Like for me, that one of the reasons that I have a background in religion and theology and sort of now I'm really involved in tra wildlife tracking is that I'm really interested in how, you know, humans map meaning onto landscapes. And, and, um, and I think that like, in in these in various realms before when I've encountered the confluence of tracking in different pedagogies, it's either taught in a way that's super clinical and um super quantitative, or it's like really ungrounded. I, and when I say tracking, I also just mean sort of like animal, what do animals mean? Like, like what do their them and their traces mean to us? It's either super ungrounded and it's like these kind of appropriative like animal like quote unquote totem dictionary type stuff you know or it's like super clinical and it's like we have to not we have to be like these really rational beings measuring everything and i i feel that um even though now i actually work more in the realm of of science and research and applying tracking to um to research i i feel that i'm still very much a mystic with it and the, what i love about the collaboration with weaving earth is um, really thinking about how mysticism at its uh, at its base in some ways is so much about forming a, a secure attachment with the unknown and with mystery. And that's also actually what what science is supposed to be about for me. Um, and 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 what's amazing about field biology and field ecology, whether you're watching bird behavior and attuning to the calls and attuning to interspecies relationships is, um you know, that like a lot of the computer models that that you know um, wildlife biologists are so enamored with these days around that are are associated with like prediction and control of of the future and of populations and of things. Um, when you get outside and go into the field and look at tracks on the ground and look at the um, patterns that the animal trails have carved into the landscape and listen to what the birds are doing this year, this month, during this time, during the eclipse, during El Nino, during climate change. Um, nothing's going to be able to predict that completely. There's always going to be a contingent path being um, charted forward by living by rivers of living bodies that um, that we can never fully predict predict with any models. Um, and in some ways, that's what tracking and trailing animals are to me is it's it's like it's it's like this practice of apprenticing to the unknown um, in this way that blends science and art just just beautifully. And I don't know of anything else that does that. Um, and so I think that's, that's one thing I've been really excited about is like, this is an offering that, that um, does mysticism, like that, that frames mysticism so well, and like oddly in a really grounded way, but, but that groundedness gives, then gives us the freedom to go into these spaces of awe and enchantment and, and, and unknown together, you know, in these times. I don't know if that makes sense, but I just wanted to, I just saw a little window in there for that. Yeah, there's so many beautiful threads that were just um, coming through and what y'all are sharing. Um, I heard, you know, the terms risk of presence and the capacity for relationship. Um, and for the time and attention that our relationships call of us. Um, and so you'd previously mentioned, you know, care and care and attention being so closely linked. And I hear that also in what you're speaking to on tracking and, and um, the secure attachment with the unknown, you know, thinking of attachment as a practice of care in a ways that we exchange in relationship and show up to life, um, show up to ourselves, show up to life that is, you know, that we're, that we are together. Um, and so I imagine that being in a, in a cohort model for a tune also invites in the unknown through what participants are bringing, you know, how each of their lived experiences informs, you know, the, the space that you're holding together. Um, and I wonder if anyone here is open to talking about like how that how that relationality comes through, um, you know, in the presencing of how everyone is showing up, you know, in their lived capacity in the moment, um, how that changes, you know, based on the, the season of the weekend, or the moment um, that you're all inviting through a specific activity.
Well, I mean, one thing I can speak to is a little more logistical, which kind of was a revelation for me at Attune, where we had a really large teaching team in my experience. And I think one of the things that that allowed us to do that is something I'm really carrying forward now with queer nature programming is just, um, is, yeah, thinking about how there's kind of this emotional social bandwidth we each have, I think, for experiences that actually makes being in large groups like really hard for like sustained periods of time. And so we ended up doing a lot of like breakout groups and like, like we would kind of off do different offerings um, with one or two kind of mentors in each group. And and that that seems like such an amazing way to work with like a large group of like 30 plus people or like I I don't know the exact number, but um I'm also just using a reference of other large groups that I've worked with. Um and and yeah, just just kind of like finding those different pathways of interest and attention that that people might want to, that beings might want to explore. Um and, and that feels like a real responsiveness to like a way to be um be in these spaces of of study and prayer together in the, these this kind of monastic way that I feel like a tune is really wanting to call in um but also that it's that yeah that within that there's these there's these times and lots of times and places where we kind of break into these quite small groups actually and um so that felt like a really amazing like weaving of the tapestry um I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to that or anything else, but um, but that felt like a really, really important um language of care, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um that that like was really um those are really resonant for me. Yeah, I can echo that. And there were a couple of things that I really noticed. One within those groups, there was also there was like we kind of were oriented toward what's the skill that we're what's the layer of skill or the layer of engagement that we're wanting to offer, but also what's the energy level? What's the thing that's going to be close to camp for folks that don't want to move? What's the thing that's going to be far from camp that for folks who really need to move. And so I think that felt really emblematic of creating opportunities for honesty and for authenticity of what is my actual capacity right now and creating um, these pockets in which people got to really check in with themselves. And then that was really the the texture, the effort of a tune. There was there's so much resource when we when we offer ourselves the capacity to disengage our attention from capitalism, when we have the possibility of disengaging our attention from social media and from computer screens and to do lists and the practices that have gotten really um, can get calcified around our sense of sense of self worth, and how it, how sometimes the like immersing ourselves in resource can actually be really exhausting, or it can be really um, sticky. It can feel really uncomfortable when we're first in that kind of almost in that detox place. And where does where sometimes the resource beads off because we don't have the actual practice or relational containers or um, even belief structures inside of us that say like it's okay for me to rest, it's okay for me to to have this relationship to be seen to be witnessed to be immersed in resources really risky when we are um, indoctrinated with narratives of scarcity and and violence and we're inundated with violence and so i think that there was also something about how do we continuously attune to what is real for us at each moment that allows us to actually drink in and absorb some of the resource that's available here. Um, and then how does that start to create a feedback cycle in, in and of itself? And I kept like laughing um, at moments because I couldn't believe some of the relational stamina I was witnessing as someone who gets social fatigue. I was just like, wow, we're all still choosing to sit at this fire. It's day seven. And we're still choosing to like sit at this fire at night and sing and laugh. And now someone's cooking. And now there's there's more um, of this person here. And there's something that being immersed in place and casting our attention down on substrate and casting our attention up at the sky and tracking the weather and um, 
tracking our own inner weather patterns and being really honest with our level of fatigue or our need for space or our need for closeness that was allowing resource to sink in. And so like the, the collective nervous system changed in ways that was both like, um, like danced with both immediate and slow. That was both like deeply visceral and observable. Um, and so there was also this way in which I was, I was shocked at the, the relational stamina that was, um, sustaining at day 10 and, having been through many programs where it's like, this has been really good and I'm ready, peace. There was there was this real texture of like, this is something really special that I will savor for the rest of my days and where does it now live? I actually have a place with it. I actually have a breath it takes or a, a practice that that returns me to a quality of attention that that is sustaining. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Taylor. Um, I wanted to also add something as as well regarding this. Um, yeah, I feel one of the things that comes up for me is um, so I one of the things with tracking or like delving into tracking as um, for me in an an indigenous life way um, as well as an act of it's been a pathway for me in terms of uh, psychiatric abolition as someone who's neurodivergent and who's um, a psychiatric survivor um, and someone who tends to go um, between verbal and nonverbal states. Um, and one of the things that I experienced in this and brought in this um, space or felt like I was able to engage in this configuration of um, relationship and kinships, um, as well as the place we were at, which was Quail Springs on Chumash land, which is a place that I've had um, <clears throat> relationship to for about 11 years um, and returning and marking and being held by this place felt a, like a huge part of what was possible. Um, and arriving there, oh gosh, um, I don't, the day before people arrived and seeing, getting to witness to California condors um, welcome us into the space, which is apparently, I think this was the second time um, people at Quail Springs said that they've seen condors. Um, I don't know what was the period in which they said the second time, like for, since how long, but I imagine at least a decade, I'm not sure. So just how um, precious um, that encounter is, was and is and really affected um, the place and affected what was possible, um, especially with the eagle and the condor prophecy that was brought in, um, that, that felt very present and palpable in that encounter in space. Um, and the piece that I wanted to also share is I, um, it was interesting. I've been doing my best to practice disrupting, um, internalized ableism and in, of how I should show up as a facilitator um, should. Um, and I I was pretty honest with people in terms of when I was a bit more verbal and I was not, um, whether it was with students or um, with the leadership team. And it was really interesting to push the edge of um, my own capacity with that, with that transparency and that the truth of really actively trying to disrupt, um, yeah, internalized sanism and ableism. And um, it was interesting, it was really vulnerable for me to do that and just share, as Taylor was sharing, like, what what is the energy levels? What are the energy levels? And I was sharing a bit about how slow I'm going to go and not only physically, but also verbally or going to be more sen like um, sensory based rather than um, verbal based. And it was really interesting because I noticed myself apologizing at some point with um with one of the students and they were just like, no, like I like crave this slowness. Like I need this slowness. And you um like you and other neurodivergent people in the space sharing that um unapologetically, um that you take a while with words or that you are more on a like a nonverbal state. Um or that you're going to move 
really slow and physically um, really gives me permission to do that because I because this person in particular hasn't really seen that reflected before in leadership. Um, and that just brought so much warmth to my, it, it felt like it widened the space um, in such a beautiful way. Um, and just one more story uh, that, that feels important is at um, one point, I think this was like a day later, I was experiencing some sensory overwhelm, um, <clears throat> sensory overload and started to cry, um, which is a way I process sensory overload. It's not emotional. It's more just like sensor, my senses are um, just like overwhelmed and something needs to be processed. And someone came up to me, or actually I approached someone <laughs> and um, a student and um, they're they're also autistic. And I just shared with them what was happening and just like, could if we could just, if they could just lean against me like side by side. And um, they, um, and I started again, apologizing. I'm like, oh, should I be doing this? Like I'm, you know, in a facilitation role. And they were like, I just want to let you know, I was considering like just, there's been a part of me that doesn't know if I should be here because of my own sensory overwhelm. And, and the fact that you just showed up uh, like in this way where I could also, we could be met in our sensory sensitivities um, really, you know, uh, made me feel like I could be more available to show up here in my, in my whole self. Um, Cause they were apparently considering departing because of how much sensory stuff was coming up for them. Um, and that just, uh, yeah, that it felt like a collective capacity building. Um, and also disturb this whole hierarchy of like, this is what a facilitator does. And like, uh, you know, and this is how like a facil like leadership um, or people in leadership should disrupt ableism in this um, socially acceptable way and not this way. Um, so yeah, I was, I feel like the land really helped stretch that in me to show up. And there were other students who just, yeah, the neurodivergent piece was really alive for me, especially when talking about nervous system and building capacity, that's like very inherently a part of the conversation uh, with um, attention differences and nervous system sensitivities. So I just want to um, bring in and weave in those stories as well. And thank you so much for that. Um, use we're kind of closing with this comment on that as a like a responsibility or way to be with the power that comes with facilitation or you know holding a program being an organization you know having the structure that you are all working with with collaborators collaborators beyond who's on this call by the way um, there are many people involved in in uh, in a tune and in weaving earth and I'm sure many collaborators supporting queer nature um, and especially with the ways that, you know, attention right now kind of went, um, can increase towards a platform and acknowledging the platform that you all are responsible to, that you, that you choose in your public image and um, the ways that you engage as leaders in community um, and to like open up into the collective isn't a reordering necessarily it's it's coming into relationship with and the transparency and vulnerability of being affected and being open about how you're affected by where you are who you're with and then in turn being um like claiming the ways that we affect each other you know the effect and impact that you have on another and that alone is an expanded awareness and capacity you know, for for holding space, for holding a group, um, for facilitating a process together. Um, and that's one of the things that um, really stands out to me in, uh, you know, among what's being shared here and from what I've learned about Attune through reading about the program is, you know, that affectability, you know, being, being changed and changing and, being alive at the edge of that with the unknown with that mystical framework of you know we don't who knows where where this is going to lead or what is going to be exchanged in this place and it also opens up you know the 
ways that we hold, you know, positionality um, in social spaces or kind of how that's being used, um, you know, in other settings. And I'm sure in this setting too, where how I know where I'm sitting, where I am, what's, you know, what I'm connected to um, shapes so much in, in how I show up. And even though I can't always introduce myself with all of that, leaning into these moments of disclosure, of connection, of vulnerability, um, allows so much of that to, to come to the surface. And then within a, with land, you know, and holding the mythology, which I, I read as a part of the fugitive awareness section, you know, the, the patterns that are alive in our myths and the prophecies that, that we carry um, and listen into as we listen in with place and with the condors and the eagles and, you know, whoever is, is present with us, whoever we're noticing, whoever's calling our attention or we're offering our attention to, um, all of that is um, like, we're all at like at the brink, <laughs> we're all at the brink of this moment together. Yeah, I have something to add, but I also don't want to jump in too much if there's more, if you're going to ask another prompt or if Bronte or Taylor, you want to say anything. Cool. And thanks for the heart. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that something else I was really struck by as an educator and like someone who mentors folks specifically around kind of wildlife tracking and naturalist stuff was it really also gave me uh, an amazing um arena to kind of embody some some ways of kind of um making that transaction or that um that apprenticeship to animal tracks and sign and signs of past presence or current presence um less extractive because i think in in the sort of naturalist and also in the tracking community at least the way it in its some of its current iterations um, in in sort of North American sort of naturalist culture um, or like birding too. Sometimes like the kind of more species list birding can fall into this where it's like, what can I get out of this landscape? Like going to a landscape and being like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're listening to the land, we're listening to the landscape, but also still having the the kind of narrative or just operating system of like, what can I, like what sightings and detections can I get out of this land? And like, I have to find those things and like kind of show people like, as if it's this like museum, you know? Um, and it was really cool because this land, I think, I don't know if it was cause it had rained recently or like, even though there was a lot of sand at Quail Springs, we really didn't find that many clear tracks, like in terms of like footprints, like, and, 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 um, and it was really, yeah, it was just really interesting because, um, I think that, um, it, it kind of also sort of forced all of us to, um, to go about teaching tracking in sort of a different way. And one of the things that came out of that was, um, this is like, I won't share details of this story because it's someone else's story to share, but our colleague Naika, who's an amazing astrologer um, and uh, just a person, they they ended up stumbling upon a bear skeleton, um, a complete like black bear skeleton of um, an old bear with really worn down teeth who had lived a long life and um had died in what it, what looked like in their bed. They they were all the bones were in one location, which is kind of rare for mortality sites. Um, and it was in it was on this intersection of trails, um, of bear trails or game trails in this really brushy area where a, a person generally wouldn't choose to walk unless they were kind of, um, you know, like like Nike was in a place where they were kind of trying to find the best path down this pretty steep area. Um, and ran into this 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 being, um, and I and we end that ended up being this this amazing kind of one of the most amazing tracking or sort of sign or trace encounters of the whole week, um, and we were able to several actually the whole group was able to look at the skull of this being um, before we put it back to their resting place, 
Um, and just the teeth were so worn down and one of the canines was broken during life. And just the, just like, I don't know, to encounter like this being who belonged in this landscape. So in such a sort of like, like coupled way with this land to the, to the point where they were like in this bed under this really like brushy area in this bush um, and just like laid there to rest to die um and i think that that it was such there was I, i'm not going to do it justice with words but there were so many teachings there around like belonging um and also like around how it took a long time for us all to get to the place where collectively someone in our group would even stumble upon that that sacred hidden cryptic space um and so i think it it was a it was it's been a big teaching for me around um that yeah like a lot of the time that energy of seeking um it can it can act, cause us to like push things away from us as we're trying to find things uh, especially if we're we're seeking like i want to see that bird i want to find that track and and we're moving over land a lot and um and i think a lot about like the energy of like what pushes and pulls animals across landscapes including human animals and just our impacts and our affects and um and there's also just an, an energy of drawing in that can happen too that i think is tricky sometimes for us as trackers and naturalists and people who love to find mysteries um but the, recently last last week i had an experience with a naturalist friend where we um were following some really fresh turkey tracks on a road right next to my house and the dust was very fine and you could see the the patterns in the fingers uh, um, of the fingers and toes of this bird, these birds. And um, they were so fresh that we were like, they, they're, they've got to be here somewhere. And we looked up and about 150 meters ahead of us, was this, these big basketball shaped black dots on the landscape. And they were a group of toms um, of eight Tom turkeys. And we, we kind of froze because every, like everyone knows in kind of the tracking and hunting and naturalist community that turkeys are, notoriously wary and like will avoid people like will especially with their vision their extremely extremely acute vision and so we kind of were like and there was literally a we were on a dusty road that led to us and where the turkeys were because they just walked up that road and then we were following the tracks and they they were aware of us they were looking at us and so we had this reaction where at first we were like oh like yeah there's this notion of like let's get as close as possible without flushing them and see if we can do that to like observe them really closely because we like want that contact but then we were like no actually let's like step back and give them space and so we stepped back and sat off the road about only about 10 feet off the road and it's shrub step so it's open grassland like there's nowhere we could hide um and it's interesting because I've been, I, I teach, Panar and I teach a lot of stealth craft curriculum around kind of more extreme invisibility practices. Um, but what's really interesting is when you're trying to become comfortable and get animals, have animals in your landscape become comfortable for you, you kind of have to dare to be known because they're, they're smart and they're going to figure out that you're there and it's impossible to be extremely like cartoonishly stealthy all the time and doing that is actually a threat to animal they, other animals see that as a, a they don't appreciate being being stalked or being or being looked at from this really hidey place you know so we sat down in the open and uh we just watched and we were kind of chatting to ourselves casually not not being super quiet because a lot of the time animal like deer and turkeys and other wary animals they like to orient so they like to, if you're talking casually or knitting or journaling and moving slightly they that helps them know that you're that you're chill and you're you're focusing on something you know and and um that you're not focusing on them intensely so Phil and I were chatting chatting a little bit and then all of a sudden i see this tom like crest the hill like 20 meters away from us and i touch phil's knee and i'm like phil they're coming towards us the turkeys are coming towards us and um everything in our heads around like that we've heard from our friends who are turkey hunters about how difficult it is to get close to these birds was just in, it, totally opposite to the experience we were having. And we were totally breathless as this group of eight toms walked right by us, like 20 feet in front of us and just looked at us. And they, and then they walked right by us. And then when they got about a little bit past us, they just hopped right back on the road. Cause of course it was their road and that they wanted to go down the road. And, um, 
I kind of was blown away by that because I think what, what I noticed, and this is something that horse trainers talk about a lot with pressure and release stuff with training horses. And we can really do that and, and practice that with the land. And there's so much power in releasing pressure um, with our kin. And I'm so curious with that too, with like Taylor, it makes me think of your work too, with like, how does that, like there, there's something alchemical there that happens, but it's vulnerable to do it because we're letting, we're stepping back. We're not doing like the, like seeking, like the dopamine seeking thing that like many of us are good at, including myself. And then we're, we're, we're releasing pressure and something's happening there. Um, and in, in some ways it felt like that happened with the bear skeleton too, like pressure got released and then someone just wandered to their death site where they died belonging with the land. And we, we got to see that as a group or got to witness it in some way. Sorry, that was really long. I hope they didn't ramble too much. No, I love it. I love it. Dave Palms strutting by, checking you out. And it was cute because they were all practicing strutting because like it's right before they go to do that for the, the ladies. But although some of them might be queer turkeys. I don't know. Some some of them might be like, sweet, this is like my time to shine. But like they were doing this thing where they would they were just pecking and foraging the ground and shuffling like they normally do. But then every now and then one of them would do kind of this like half hearted tail fan and then it would just kind of deflate and they would just. <laughs> It was just like they were getting ready. <laughs> it was actually so a pretty awesome. clear space. It was cool. <laughs> it was so cute. Mm. Yeah, it has me in this like felt sense to like how do we how do we know when that pressure is is on? How do we know when that pressure is released? And there's like there's all of these landscapes that can be information sites for that. Um, as in this story with the turkeys and this and, the, and our kin being able to say like, oh, there's safety here, right? And so I can approach and um, and part of like the node that I've been holding inside of Weaving Earth for the past several years as a as an educator and uh, a curricular designer and um, this the whatever other hats I wear on any given program um, is also really allowing us to anchor into those moments of pressure release so that we can actually bring our awareness into how we are in our bodies in relationship with whatever, um, whomever that allows us to actually track when we're we're moving from a place of pressure, when we're moving from a place of laser focus, of of seeking, um, which has its place, but it's becomes with all of our um, ways in which the world has kind of conditioned us to use our bodies, use our eyes, use our hands, use our focus, um, that it's it it feels it feels odd in some way to be able to actively step into choice about what kind of quality of, of pressure we're wanting to negotiate with and actually being in a recognition that um, that choice exists inside of pressure um, and pressure was a was was and I think will be some some part of our like larger conversation and a tune and and um, a real teaching point for for all of us is how do we actually track it how do we know what it feels like? How do I know what release feels like if I've been operating in the world with such intense pressure for for however many long, uh, many years or many moments? Um, and so this invitation into real discernment is, um, I think, what part of our collective like effort toward finding ourselves anchored into place and place anchored in us. Um, has been a quality of that prayer of like, how do I get it into discernment? How do I know the difference? How do I know? And, and like, that's actually knowable for us and that we can actually be in choice about it and how we relate to one another can actually be a playground where we get to actually engage with that in safe ways and in consensual ways so that we can actually 
um, move out of the habit of pressure and it actually becomes a place of play. Um, so that's some of the, we can repattern our relationships to pressure in some way. Um, and that feels very much like the larger arc of like what I know of what everybody's up to and a lot of the work that, that we're all hoping and, and moving towards. Um, I'll just add one thing um, regarding pressure and one thing that I've been um, apprenticing to and for some time and also finding or like finding and being found um, in groups in particular with wandering um, on the land and <clears throat> being open enough to not find or seek, but to be found. So that relationality, um, speaking about mystics in particular and like a collective of mystics coming together, um, a lot of mystics are very porous um, people and beings, um, porous in the sense of permeable, uh, permeable to different um, experiences uh, nuances and textures of experience um, that are happening simultaneously at once, um, like the depths, um, as well as, um, yeah, spiritual encounter uh, or being encountered by, by the depths and also by spirituality and spirit. Um, and so how to cultivate continuing to be porous in a world that that's very the dominant the overculture where it's really threatening to be porous um and with tracking to me it's a practice of engaging in <clears throat> continuing to widen to porosity enough to um widen our widen ourselves to listen to stories um that are happening while we are having our stories. So while we're storied by place, there are other stories happening simultaneously and trails weaving um, and braiding and going away from one another and that push and pull, that pressure release. And um, yeah, I think I find myself in a place of how do we wander in our senses? <clears throat> and instead of seeking, like I wanna find a clear track um, how can we, as like a collective, um, be found by these beings, these encounters, um, which, you know, some of these stories here that are being shared are beautiful examples of that. Um, and to be able to be porous, we have, and especially in a group of people, um, other humans, that is, I think it's, yeah, we have to stretch our nervous systems and be yeah, take the risk of being present in the moment together um, with our with our nervous systems um, as um, yeah as creatures who are sensitive and porous and um, yeah. So I'm just really feeling into the the depth of that as how that how that invitation really and the land really um, invited us to go deeper into. Um, yeah, inviting that porosity because curiosity is such a vulnerable, um, it's, it's so vulnerable nervous system wise to be, to be uh, curious and open and porous um, with other, um, capital O other, just, uh, um, yeah, the sacred other. So, which is such a mystical part of, or mystical, um, such a core part of mysticism. So I just wanted to bring that in as well. I loved um, all of the experiments that we explored out of tune and pressure. Um, and I'm thinking about the first, our first session and having the, I just couldn't catch my breath right before our first session. It was being hosted at the ranch that I posted with my partner and um, feeling fear around um, the way that the, this program touches on some really core uh, birthright longings for 
us as creatures around these pieces around secure attachment to mysticism and mystery and connection and relationship and belonging and what if we miss the mark and what if this and this is this is not going to be enough like not being able to accept that this will not be enough and this will not fulfill that desperation and my own desperation for that longing my own desperation for that connection and being the same age as most of the participants and it being a mixed group and um where are we going to fail and fail this long fail these the longing of the participants and um where are we also going to create harm because we can't offer what we promise so there was a lot of fear there and also Taylor Pinar and so were not that first one. So I was like, <laughs> please, God, help. <laughs> um, and I could not catch my breath. And it was so interesting. And it was very similar to a dream I had in at that at the same site in Kashaya Pomo territory, where I realized that the word Walala in a name of a town in that place, that's a Kashaya word for water coming down place. I realized in the dream that the Kashaya, um, that that word came from mountain lions. And in the dream, I was saying it like a cat and kind of growling it like a cat. But when I started to say it, it started to bring me into like this dark void. And I started ascending and my partner was calling me down to come back. And it was such a similar experience when I had the panic attack before the first session where I was like could not catch my breath and he was saying Bronte 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 just come literally saying the same thing come back come back which was the same thing from my dream and I felt through this arc um into Taylor's point of the um risking being present there has been this permission and forgiveness from the participants to that I'm so grateful for that has and and a forgiveness to myself and a permission with myself to be um a student and to release the pressure of expertise and mastery um that is pretty common in being in a seat of facilitation um with students who are seeking a, a kind of level of knowledge that they want to be provided to and like they they're like coming really thirsty and hungry um and yeah being able to be like it just reminds me of Jesus with the like fish and loaves and just you gotta feed all of these people and somehow all of the all of the food gets there um also I don't know how we had beef in the desert really actually <laughs> we actually had a lot of like physical real food <laughs> Um, to eat but there there's something about the um like hey look I got this I got this much and somehow this miracle coming of what is able to be um yeah just something about being present with what we can offer and the kind of gospels and beauty that can come of of coming with our brokenness I just really feel the ways that it's a young teaching team and um, I feel the longing for elders so desperately in this work um, and the loss of so many of our elders and or disconnection from our elders and at our second session there was a at our first session the Kashaya community couldn't be there because of harm in the community um, of a loss of a child and in the second session, we had a young queer Chumash person come to give the opening prayer of the session. And they were so vulnerable and nervous um, and naming that they were coming to their lineage um, in a new, in a recent way of coming to coming to their lineage in terms of just recently learning the songs and learning some of the prayers. And there was fear of not being in that kind of seat of expertise and what maybe we all wanted not being indigenous to this place we're seeking from them. And there was this like 
exhale from everyone when we could all just be true that we're all trying to come back to these teachings and we don't have we don't have the songs and we don't have all of the prayers but we have the will and there's this like just that circle of will was just that alone as a prayer was just oh my god I was like, whatever language this is, I feel like this was, you know, these are the new kind of prayers that we need at this time. It was so, yeah, so potent. So I'm just grateful for that, um, that humility of accepting the brokenness and, and what's what that has provided through the program. I want to tag on that if that's okay. Because <clears throat> there's something so rich about accepting the brokenness and when I think about the life ways and the patterns of life ways that we're all in with capitalism and white supremacy and the forces of colonialism really you know disfiguring how we know to relate to one another and atrophying certain parts of our being and atrophying and arresting wonder and um and and kind of um yeah just dis disfiguring our attention toward toward intensity toward just like real intensity um to like avoid boredom or avoid <laughs> right like to to avoid stillness and really this longing for an intense world and we live in such an intense world and then we're plugged into all of the the different outlets that let us consistent consistently remind one another and ourselves that it's an intense thing to be alive right now and that that's very true and it can't go on right that we're also inside of a moment of collapse a moment of intensity that comes from from things getting ready to to fall apart um, on on ecological levels and social levels and spiritual levels and all of these ways in which intensity has become a, a defining feature of how we orient ourselves as humans. Um, and the real risk to the real risk of of letting go of some of that intensity and the possibility of getting bored and the possibility of being idle, which has been so criminalized through um organized religion and capitalism right we can't be idle and so what like the the real risk and the real danger and the real anxiety and the real textures of fear that come by just sitting ourselves down in a place and letting it move around us and casting our awareness out and about and into it and there's something that's so risky about that. And I think that I'll speak for myself, like I have such a longing to be a part of like whatever that vanguard is that's found our way out of calamity. Like I want to be a part of the solution that's found some way out of this mess. Um, there's a part of me that's historically wanted to save something save myself, save the world, save my community, save, 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 save the earth, um, save the world. And I think what this program has created space for me in, and I can feel like the charge in my body of that part of me that's just like, oh, I gotta fix it, I gotta save it, I gotta save it. Oh, yeah. um, that can't, that can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't save the world. I can't fix this. I can't, I can't get out of it. I can't like hide from it. I can't, but I can be here for it. And that so much is what the prayer of how do I re-embed myself in ecologies? How do I listen? How do I not go seeking, but really just engage and trust that there is something I that my attention offers a landscape, trust that there's there's some value in my eyes resting gently here um, and bearing witness and also in being seen that if I, I can continue to deepen in my trust of that, I, I kind of allow that energetic of saviorism and that energetic of having to fix or change all of the things um, 
that energy shifts and I get to resituate myself in a way that creates a pocket for another way of being to take hold. And I get to start to repattern myself in relationship to it. And it allows me to then be um, responsive to what is actually happening instead of trying to be reactive and trying to save something that maybe has I have uh, one, I can't, but two, I might not have any business saving. It might, it's just not appropriate. It's actually not what's being asked or not what's even in, in the, um, in possibility. And so there's something I think within that of like, how do I actually just get here or whatever is happening, whether it's fire, whether it's drought, whether it's a hummingbird sipping nectar, whether it's a storm, whether it's this, whether it's that, whether it's my grief or my rage or my wonder or whatever it might be, or this person needing something, like how do I actually just get here instead of trying to live in some other place, um, either through my actions, um, which doesn't absolve me from trying to live gently it actually gives me um, a relationship in which I get to know how I'm living. Um, it actually uh, like anchors me in feedback um, and redips me back into reciprocity. So it's not my idea that I'm trying to chase, but really um, a responsiveness in relationship that, uh, that guides me of how to be. And that helps me shrink back down to my appropriate size um, and actually lets me be like as here for it as I can, knowing that sometimes I can't be. And that that also helps me buffer myself with compassion. Because um, it's a lot. It's a lot to be here for. Both the awe and the grief and everything in between. Thank you. I'm going to bring my voice in and catch this a little bit with my eye on the time and um, and really hearing so much intentionally or not summarized in what you just shared, Taylor, and the ongoing practice of attunement, um, of auspicious attention, of listening and being seen and seeing, and just like the myriad of sensory exchanges that are alive now and now, <laughs> every now, and what to do with that how to discern, you know, what is this, is this my projection onto, you know, the Tom? <laughs> or am I really listening here? You know, I think for some of us as beginners to tracking or to attunement, um, it can be helpful to honor that discernment. You know, what is, what are the edges here? What are the right boundaries? And how how is the balance and the flow of, of energy communicating those boundaries? And also what is a state of an exchange where the connection holds more of the focus than the discernment, than the difference? And where are we listening, you know, picking up some things in the chat, listening to dreams, you know, from threads and the potent stories you've shared, you know, listening to the past when the bear laid to rest, you know, and this feedback that we're listening for can sometimes be we can sometimes notice it presently. And sometimes it's, you know, generations away or, you know, <laughs> in the nonlinear sense of time. And where where do we notice that? Where do we where do we hold that and practice that with our inner collective and the collective that, you know, we're interdependently mixing with? Because uh, there's so much I see in the parallels of tracking interoceptively, you know, the somatic tracking or the tracking of dreams or the train of thought or the internalization of systems of harm, you know, and there's the tracking around us. And what is that conversation? You know, we can have a story of what the conversation is. And there's also an exchange happening that, that may be imperceptible to our attention. And our awareness can grow to maybe catch a glimpse of that to be enchanted in awe or grief or any of the above. And um, and there's also just just the being with and, and, and having a capacity to move with, to witness, 
to be with the big questions. You know, I saw some other questions in the chat, you know, that to see just wh where people are arriving to, to conversations on gender or the right relationship with nature. And these are really big questions that from my position, I think we can hold in community and hold in conversation. And it, there are nuances for all of our worldviews and you know all of the ways that we've been shaped to relate to ourselves and, and to others. And for me personally, being with land, listening beyond myself or beyond you know, a human interaction where my self-awareness can sometimes bring a collapse when I really just want to be in connection. You know, I go beyond human and I take these big questions and I, and I trust that, I forget how you said, I think just like softening your gaze or, you know, just trusting the value in putting my body in a space that isn't in front of a computer. <laughs> You know, that simple act um, for as much as the computer calls me and brings a certain type of connection that I can register, um, you know, in my uh, my default mode of my mind. Um, there's so much more that's calling. Um, <clears throat> and I know that there is a lot buzzing among this group that we're collected with, too. So we have, you know, about 12 minutes One of my favorite numbers for whatever reason. Um, but I'm going to run with it. Uh, I did see a question in the chat also of, um, you know, directed towards you, Taylor, but I think this is open for all of us to relate with, you know, how for Taylor, how does the upper peninsula or for all of you, how do the places that you hold and that hold you, how do they impact your work, your rest, your play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that question. Good old UP up here. <clears throat> and I think the the thing that's coming to my mind, there's so many things. This place is um I'm I'm currently on occupied Anishinaabe territory on my on the shore, the the southern shore of Lake Superior um this massive body of very cold fresh water um and it's spring and there's buds finally happening and day lilies are peeking out of the ground and winter is long and cold and gray and i think one of the things that i'm really with about this place in particular is how um tenacity moves across a landscape how tenacity is shaped and how it gnarls branches how it compels us to continue to move snow around so we can find access to one another how it how the sand or how the ground softens during what we are calling now mud season the way that being in the woods requires tenacity in june when the mosquitoes hatch there's just a quality of grit that um is is not just like um uh called forth but required to be anchored here um and i find that that quality of grit is helping me to kind of thicken thinking of the work of resmomenicum and how do we re relate across difference in in the context of racialized bodies and racialized trauma and this place in particular helps me to thicken my skin and soften my heart how do I just allow myself to be gritty and get to work and use my body and be tough and be and weep when the when the robins return? How do I allow myself to be in the ache of really cold hands and in the joy of apricity of the warmth of sun in winter? Um, it's it's calling forth and and creating a, a a shape of tenacity in my body that. Um, kind of becoming everything at this moment. So I'm grateful for that. I could say more, but I'll, I'll end there. I'm so moved to receive that. 
and we can also bring this bring the scope a little smaller how has how has life touched you today where you are and maybe we can open up the chat for that one too I might drop something in the chat because I want to share something, but I don't want it to take up too much of our remaining time. So I'm going to just drop it in the chat here. I think so. Appreciate the context. Kayla just mentioned the eclipse in the chat, and that's exactly what I was thinking of. I um, unfortunately wasn't in the path of total eclipse, but I was watching virtually. <laughs> Um, on the television, people's experience of it as it was happening um, and was feeling a mix of joy and regret and who knows what else. Almost the sense of wonder that I was vicariously experiencing and reminding me that I can drop into that space even where I am now too. But that was a powerful, powerful moment. Kevin. So there's a stellar J that I've been noticing more and more just outside my window, um, picking at the vines and even the, the threads that keep our blackberries um, in position as, as they grow and, and, and fill this, this patch of earth. Um, and I just feel great kinship and curiosity with this stellar J. Um, and every time I recognize them in other places, kind of in this proximity, I, I like I feel so affirmed in that connection just from witnessing them and you know out my window into all the terrain where where they where they roam around. And they were with us a bit today. Um, thank you. I I wanted to share a bit about um, a couple of encounters that have been really with me. In particular, one um, I have been um, really courted by snakes recently, um, and just the vulnerability of being on your belly your entire life, just belly to earth um moving moving that way um as such a tender that's such a tender part of our bodies of any creature body um so i've just been really feeling what it would be like to to move in that way and to like expose the tender belly of myself um to the world and feel the texture of the ground in that way um and i ha in the last couple of days i've been having um some encounters with a rattlesnake um a very particular one um who's just been really beautifully um undoing and unraveling me in such a delicious way um yeah um and yeah just being with being with rattlesnake being with the rattle the the boundary the boundary setter the soft the softness of who they are um and how they get overlooked in such demonized ways um and again just returning to the belly um and how they're reconfiguring me in a way that I um I'm not expect I have not expected. So I'm just with them right now. Hmm. Thanks, Panay. Um I've been thinking about this um scripture in the Hebrew Bible and in the Old Testament in the Christian Bible, um, Job one seven, where God and several times asked Job where he's been, and I mean, asked the devil where he's been, and Satan, or where they've been, I don't know what their gender is. 
and the devil's like, I've been roaming, I've been roaming around on the earth, and they, they just keep, Satan keeps saying that, and then I'm just thinking again of Satan as a snake, and yeah, just this like, on being on the ground, I'm just curious about, I'm skeptical of all things being demonized, um, and what kind of ways that's connected to anti-blackness and fear of shadows and um yeah thinking of a dream i had recently where i kept saying to a friend isn't it wild how they tried to separate the devil from god um when the devil is god and just yeah thinking about that fleshiness of the snake on the land um and i just want to share where I live and where we're going to host our last attune session um, for the past three years, I've been hearing this sound um, that's just been this like, <laughs> and at first I didn't know what the sound was and thought it was like a dryer or something, the dryer outside, like, and um, someone from the resource district, the local like conservation district came and was like, oh, you guys have the city grouse out here. And so it was just this really special intimacy when their sound comes back of for the past three years, hearing that <laughs> and what it does in my body and having so many dreams of like coming across the male city grouse and seeing them and just being so shocked to see their flamboyant yellow and just their gorgeous yellow eyebrows and just so elegant and um, coming back from a tune, I just felt like I had literally been anointed in my attention. Like, I mean, just magical experiences left to right from a willingness to come again and again to that kind of devotional awareness. And I was on the high, um, I was on the big windy road and, um, I saw a grouse hen and it was like, oh my gosh, I mean, I barely even see a grouse hen. Then I saw another grouse hen on the road, and then I saw the male grouse, and there he was, strutting on that road, and I was in such a dangerous place on the road, and they let me just stay with them for three minutes, and I would have stayed longer had someone else not drove by and asked me what was wrong, and I was there crying, saying, it's a male grouse, it's a male grouse. Um, but yeah, I'm just feeling the ways that miracles take time like that's what that felt like just like yeah miracles taking time and like god revealing themselves in very mysterious ways over time sometimes in these more subtle ways and sometimes in these more illustrious ways um and like that not being the pinnacle moment but it just being so much more beautiful because of that patient that level of patience and willingness to keep like loving them and being curious about the sound like it just made it so much more profound to see them so i'm so grateful for the land that i live in Pomo territory for it teaching me about that that relationship to time Thank y'all. I'm feeling so deeply nourished and alive. And I hope that all of us in this space are feeling in connection with, with each of our aliveness, feeling nourished, feeling well-fed. Um, and if you feel so called, I invite you to come to the chat and, and feed our guests too with reflections, with shout outs, with um, threads that have touched you today. Uh, it's the most ultimate feedback to be feeding back to those who have fed us. Um, and uh, yeah, I just have a heart full of gratitude. We're at time. Um, I do feel like this conversation could keep going on. There's so many pieces that are still up for me. Um, and I wanna invite all of you to come back same time, different Zoom link um, tomorrow from one to 2.30 uh, for a conversation on counter mapping. Um, I'll be sharing a bit of my project uh, called Narrative Cartography, which really touches into a lot of the um, aspects of 
coming into relationship in an embodied way uh, with with place, with oneself, and having a, um, a format for that inner and outer to blend together so that um, we can find that thread of narrative that we're we weaving together, the map that we're making together um, without it just coming from the eye of the cartographer. Uh, we'll be looking at some other forms of counter mapping um, and unpacking the uh, relationship with queerness and queer spaces in that as well. Um, it's been such a joy to be here with you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to host the conversation. Um, and any closing thoughts, I, I open the floor. We shall unmute. Or not, that, that is also the option there, yeah, yeah. Just offer gratitude for everyone's attention. Um, we we are aware of the labor it is to to cast it our way, and are fed by your attention. And um, yeah, there's no small thing. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for your care. You, you like just all seeing all the comments. I it seems like you're all such an amazing, deep thinking and feeling group of people, and it just feel like that's the kind of way I want to spend my time if I'm not out on the land tracking is like sharing about it with folks like this so thank you and also thank you for even the the quiet voices too thank you for your silence as well and your con contemplation um even if you didn't speak a lot thank you so much everybody thank you all Thank you. Thank you. Should we stay on at all? Any anyone? The um, this facilitator team or.